Thank you, Lee. That was very insightful. And it's amazing to think it's going to be in Russia and in Kazakhstan. So that's a great achievement. Uh, I'd now like to welcome Associate Professor Larry McNichol to discuss Module 1, which covers critical bleeding and massive transfusions. And Professor McNichol is the Director of Anesthesia at Austin Health and the Chairman of the Victorian Consultative Council for Anesthetic Mortality and Morbidity. So please welcome Professor Larry McNichol. Thanks very much, Sophie. And uh, I'll just say to Daryl and Craig, it wasn't far to walk. Three wise monkeys, or maybe not so wise monkeys. Um, I'd just uh, like to um, uh, thank uh, Lee um, and the NBA uh, for getting us to this day. Um, it's been a really long ride. Um, I think that those of us that were involved from the outset, uh, many of whom are uh, here today, uh, first met back in March or April of 2008 to, to start this process. And by the time the obstetric and paediatric modules are complete, hopefully at the end of next year, that's a, that's a pretty long haul. Um, it is an exciting time for us all. Uh, if, with your indulgence, I just want to spend a little bit of time if, if, on behalf of the, the clinicians involved in the guidelines review to talk about the process. And then uh, I'll just mention a few of the key elements in the critical bleeding and massive transfusion module. The language has changed, paradigm shift, whatever you like to call it, and it's long overdue. Those of us that were involved uh, trying to get some traction for implementation of the previous NH and MRC guidelines um, were quite frustrated with just getting awareness and knowledge about them, never mind whether they can be implemented. But I think we've come a relatively long way, and these, the language of patient blood management is now um, here to stay. Um, the focus has gone quite correctly from the product, which is life-saving and very therapeutic intervention, but as we have discovered, is a hazard as well. It doesn't come without some baggage. And so now, in the decade between the two sets of guidelines, we've gone from the product to the patient, and very appropriate. As Lee has said, um, there were some, quite a few gaps in the previous guidelines. There was, there was nothing on critical bleeding and massive transfusion. Uh, there was a sort of scattergun approach to sort of what might be the indications for the various products. So there was certainly nothing about obstetrics and pediatrics. So there's been some gap filling in designing the modules. And what we said about doing at the early stage was to construct a set of key research questions that we call the generic questions that we wanted to apply across all the modules. And then for each particular subspecialty module to design what we thought might be the most important research questions for that um, specific area. We won't talk about much today, but importantly as well, as well as the systematic review process that was, that was very structured we sought to do some grey literature background research as well that varied in its uh, volume depending upon um, the module. Um, the process, uh, again Lee's alluded to this, um, I think as one of the people involved that's had a strong interest clinically in transfusion medicine for three decades, this has been one of the most exciting things I've been involved in because of the collaboration, because of the mutual learning. Um, we were devising the research questions and then sitting down with professional systematic reviewers and interacting uh, in order to uh, get the literature search on the right path and then evaluating the literature as we went through. Um, those of you, and there, uh, there are many here today who are very experienced researchers and are aware about the uh, robustness of the process that need to be put in place if you're going to make recommendations. And transfusion medicine has been relatively bereft of science for a long time, compared with a lot of other areas of medicine. So we were not anticipating enormous amount of scientific evidence. Perhaps that made it even more important 
to undertake this in a very structured way. So the, the modules will only contain recommendations where there was sufficient evidence from the systematic review. But even then, and with a lot of help from uh, expert medical writers, as well as those that wanted to get the clinical points across, we needed to make sure we used the language directly. Again, pretty important rules of engagement, the NH and MRC uh, levels of evidence. And when you look through the guidelines, you're not going to see too many A's. There's a few B's and there's a few C's and D's, but there's also a lot of practice points. And again, this is not people sitting around the room saying, I'm an expert, let's tell people what they should do. We felt once we had looked at the literature that it was also important to provide some guidance for clinicians in an area that is very challenging. So the practice points, and there are a lot of them, again, were felt to be an important part of the guidelines. Just to go now very briefly to a few elements in the first module. The literature in this whole field has struggled because lack of clarity about definitions. So we spent quite a few hours, first of all, trying to decide what we thought was reasonable definition of critical bleeding and massive transfusion. In order to inform the systematic review about what we were looking for. And this is one of the generic questions applied to this population. And um, it's an important one because all of us involved in this field know that over the last decade in particular there is emerging evidence that to have a red blood cell transfusion that may be life-saving may also be doing harm. So it's a fine line. So on that question, we don't have high level of scientific evidence. We just need to recognise in practice points What's, re what's important to help clinicians understand. We all know that if you deny someone access to blood when they've had a, a, a massive injury or they're bleeding from an obstetric hemorrhage or in another situation, they will die. They need it to save their life. But there is enough evidence to say the more you give in that situation, the, the bigger price you might pay. So the way to do that is to use a protocolised approach. And uh, the implementation of a massive transfusion protocol is a key element to this module's um, outcome. Just briefly, with, uh, uh, with Helen Savoyer and some others, including James Isbist, who is in the audience today, we were in Melbourne last week at a transfusion outcome research collaborative uh, whole day talk on, on obstetric hemorrhage, which is terrific timing given uh, the, the launch of the uh, work in the obstetric module. But um, Ewan Wallace, who's a professor of obstetrics at uh, Monash, um, referred to the massive transfusion protocol in his hospital as a thing of joy, a thing of beauty. Uh, and and it was, he was so impressed with how their whole behaviours have changed because of the protocol. Now, one of the other key questions in this field uh, and this is where clinicians have been voting with their feet before the evidence is necessarily there. Everybody talks about ratios and the desire to maybe give early FFP and perhaps platelets uh, to switch off a coagulopathy that might be associated with certain types of massive hemorrhage, particularly trauma and probably particularly obstetrics. When we looked at the literature, so though, with this particular question, um, the only thing we found was that what you needed is to have a massive transfusion protocol. And in that, you can include advice about the ratio of blood component therapy. But the evidence is such, and again, note here, it's only grade C, that what you needed to improve outcome was to have the protocol, not to get hung up on the ratio itself. And so practice points that fall out of that systematic review um, tell us that we weren't able to find anything that said this is the ratio we need, 
even though a lot of our consumers, which are clinicians, wanted us to be able to say, yeah, give two to one, one to one to one, all the way through. There isn't the evidence for that, even though there are some papers in the trauma literature that might suggest it. What matters is having the protocol. Um, we were also probably had some disappointment from people when this module first rolled out about was there a magic bullet in the form of activated recombinant 7A. We've all used it. We've had these patients' lives who we think might have been saved by it in various situations, but the evidence is not there for it to be um, routinely used as part of an MTP. There will be some patients where you probably can, when you've done everything else, maybe salvage them. So the key message for this module is we've offered a template for a massive transfusion protocol. We recommend that institutions, all of which have different resources and different pressures, adapted according to their local needs. Um, and again, it includes, without apology, a lot of common sense clinical advice that again is driven by our literature search, our systematic review, but hopefully it's also the sort of thing which can, if adhered to, genuinely improve patient outcomes. Just very briefly, one thing that is in there, um, is, my point there is um, tranexamic acid. Um, and there was a big trial on tranexamic acid called, tranexamic acid called the CRASH-2 study. It was in trauma populations. It wasn't published until after the deadline for this module because of our systematic review. And importantly as well, it was a different patient population. It was uh, an all-comers trauma population. But it was a very compelling trial. And so the um, improvement in outcome in large, international, well-researched, well-structured trial was the tranexamic acid improved Common sense says it, it should be in there. Um, as well as having an MTP, there needs to be some advice about um, other elements to managing the critically grieving patient, and that's in the guidelines as well. And important as well, and this came through as well in the obstetric meeting last week, is those of us that are at the coalface and um, pouring in the blood products sometimes forget the people in the lab who've gone the extra mile to provide the product um, and so knowing when to stop the MTP so that everyone can say, well done, patient's going well, thanks for your help. Uh, and again, another example of uh, the enormous collaboration. I'd just like to finish by um, uh, expressing my appreciation for being involved. Um, but also, um, there have been an enormous number of people, but I'd just like to mention three people from my perspective in the time I've been involved. Two of them are clinicians, and one of them is going to speak to you later on, Craig French. And he, with Amanda Thompson, as hematologist from Sydney, have been the co-chairs of the expert working group right from the start. They're going to see it right through, and their leadership and dedication has been a key factor in the success of these modules. And I'm really sorry that Amanda couldn't get here today. And Jen Roberts, as Lee's mentioned, has been the absolute driver at the NBA that's kept us all on our toes, kept us focused when we might be wandering off into the, the sort of mist of our own um, importance. Uh, and so, again, it's, um, I regret that uh, Jen's not able to be here, but I wanted to mention her enormous contribution. Thank you very much.